going to worship the Lord in song this morning. I am glad that you're here with us. If you're here in person or watching online, we welcome you to just relax in the presence of God and worship Him. He is our Redeemer and our Rescuer, and we're going to sing about that this morning. Worship with us. I know He rescued my soul. His blood is covered my sin. I believe. Oh, I believe. My shame is taken away. And my pain is healed in His name. I believe. Oh, I believe. I'll raise a band. Through the grave and my Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. I know He rescued my soul. We're going to watch this video. Uh, I know yesterday was 9-11, but we're going to watch this video um, about that. And so sit back, and then Jackie will come make some announcements for us. When it first happened, the minutes felt like hours. The hours felt like days. And the horror of what happened, one detail after another, could hardly be processed, much less understood. Then days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into years. Memorials were built, wars were fought, victims' names were read, survivors tried to pick up the pieces over and over again. But no matter how much time has passed, we vow to hold these memories we will never forget those who were taken from us. The world changes and shifts this way and that, but one thing stays constant. 
one thing is steady. God. God weeps with us. God mourns with us. God bottles up our tears and records them in his book. He is closer to you than your own breath and remains the cornerstone of life. God is the solid ground holding us up as the world moves beneath us. It's as true today as it was on that day. Our God reigns. He reigns over principalities and powers. His dominion stretches beyond what our eyes can see. And when the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, our God reigns. We will always remember. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to remind you of a couple quick things. I still have about 20 Astros tickets, give more or less 20 left. If anybody's interesting, that's a Saturday game, September 18th. It's an evening game. I think it starts at 6:10, if memory recalls. So just let me know. Check on me after church or email, Facebook, text, whatever you want to do. Message me to get a hold of me, and I'll make sure that. Uh, we get to exchange information so I can get those tickets to their electronics. So I'm going to start assigning seats out probably here around Tuesday. So if you can get me the information by then, uh, we'll make sure groups can stay together if, if that's what you're interested in. Also, after church today, we're going to be setting up for a meeting that we're having for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, it's the shoeboxes we collect every year. We're going to be setting up some tables, and uh, we'll be having some food for the people that are coming to the meeting. It starts at 2, and uh, we have a full circle speaker coming. Uh, we call her Full Circle because she received a shoebox in an orphanage in Mexico. Her name is Veronica Miranda, and she is actually going to uh, be speaking to us because she was adopted by a couple in San Antonio, Texas, and now she packs shoeboxes, so we're very excited to host her. She's going to be coming to speak to um, anybody who wants to stay and hear her. You know, uh, she'll be starting at around 2.30. The food will be out from 2 to 2.30. And, uh, and then we're going to have a meeting with some of the uh, churches in our area about the shoeboxes. So I invite all of you to stay for that if you would like to hear her. She's a wonderful young lady, and I'm very excited. And thank you very much for all of you who are bringing food and things like that. I really appreciate it. All right, thank you so much. Couple more announcements. First of all, if you guys did not know this, and you're all gonna feel really bad right now, children and people that still have your grandparents alive, I knew and had this on my calendar for weeks. Today is Grandparents Day. <laughs> so all you grandparents, happy Grandparents Day, and if your grandchildren did not tell you that, I'm sorry. Did my son text y'all or no? Did my son text you? Did you check your phone? Man, I gave him the heads up this morning. I said, hey, and he responded and said, oh, I will right now. So he didn't. He lied. I said, you could be the, oh, my daughter's looking. I said, you could be the first one to tell your grandparents happy grandparents day because no one remembered. And so he, but he didn't. He failed. But happy grandparents day truly to all the grandparents. You are appreciated. I, we wouldn't, I don't know what my sister would do without her kids' grandparents. And I know many of you are that way. So everyone say happy grandparents day. Happy Grandparents Day to all you, I don't want to look at anyone in case you're not a grand, to all you grandparents out there. All right, um, and now I'm going to make the announcements that are actually up there. Sunday morning, we have class from 9.30 to 10.15, the adult class, the Gospel Project, K through 6th grade classes upstairs, 7th grade and up in the Connects Gen building. Ladies retreat yesterday, Tara had forbid us from giving her flowers or anything today, and she took that so far that she's working today and next Sunday so that we can't. But Tara, you told me you would be watching. We are so grateful for an amazing ladies retreat and to our pastor's wife for a great devotion as well. But thank you, Tara. <clears throat> so much fun, great time, great memories. Um, so thank you for that. All right, Wednesday night, we have Bible study from 7 to 8 here and live streaming. 
and offering you can give in the foyer at oh at the donation station the train was early thank you the donation <laughs> station by credit card uh, cash etc you know all the ways you could give out there and then if you're watching at home online at www.gracestheplace.com forward slash donate or you can mail your checks in as well we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and thanksgiving this morning. A um, couple of, an, of requests I do need to mention. Tony Hollick, who we've been praying for um, undergoing chemo, he is in Northwest in the hospital. Um, he did develop a blood clot, and there's some things going on with him. And so we are praying for Tony and Kathy um, as well. So please keep Tony in your prayers. And then Deborah Cootie is in need of prayers um, this morning for comfort and peace. Um, so keep her in your prayers as well. And then I know there are needs. We've got some people out with different things, sicknesses and travel. And so we'll lift all of that up uh, to God now. He knows every need represented. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Join with me and uh, we'll just thank him for the opportunity to be here. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we are in your presence this morning and that we are worshiping you. God, we pray for everybody that's that's suffering today in whatever way you know every need represented. We pray for those that are out traveling with illnesses, with things going on, God. We pray for our church family. Lord, we pray for Deborah. God, just be a comfort and a peace and give her strength in the days ahead and wrap your arms around her. Lord, we pray that she will feel your presence. God, we pray for Tony Hollick and Kathy this morning that they will feel your love, your comfort, your peace. We ask that you just touch Tony and, and bring him strength and healing and restore him, God. Lord, we lift up every need and we lift up our offering. We lift up our hearts full of thanksgiving. We praise you that we have the freedom to be here today and worship together. God, we pray. Yesterday was a tough day in our country, and we pray for those who have mourned and had loss in that, God, at this 20-year anniversary. Lord, we just pray for everybody that, that suffered and mourns that still today, God. Lord, we just ask that you be a blessing to our church family and to each person here and, and all of us and bring us back safely together next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to sing this next song, um, Come As You Are. And there's a part in this that says, uh, Come As You Are, Fall In His Arms. And I'm always reminded, who have you ever had the falling dream where you, you're you falling in your sleep and you startle and you wake up? I hate, I hate that. I hate the feeling of falling and not being caught. And one time our daughter was in a play she was a maiden in um, Robin Hood, and she was in a play, and she had to have a feigning scene. And we had these these people. There was supposed to be a person there to catch you in the fainting scene. Well, that person got distracted. There was like a, a injury of some kind, and <laughs> that person got distracted. But she was in her character and doing what she was supposed to, and she fainted dramatically like she was supposed to, and there was no one to catch her, and she fell. And we all did the slow motion thing where you're going to, but you can't. And when that happened, we, you know, we got a laugh out of it at her expense later. Um, I don't think she was thrilled, but we did. But that is that feeling. There, people will do trust exercises, and I'm just not that trusting. I just, I can't. I love you all, but I can't think of anyone in here that I trust to just fall back and you'll catch me. Maybe because I grew up with a dad that plays pranks. I don't know. Um, I don't I don't trust people to catch me. I will catch myself. I don't trust people to catch me. And so I struggle with that. But when we were singing that this morning, I thought of that feeling of, of being scared of falling and not being caught. And then the line, fall in his arms. When we... The, this song is all about coming as you are with your sin and your baggage and your heaviness and the way you are. We, when we go places, we try to get ready quick when we go on family trips and we bought my mom some wigs because she's a little bit slower than the rest of us at getting ready sometimes. So we bought her some wigs so that she can come as she is and she can just throw a wig on and we can go somewhere. Um, and, but then she has to fix her wigs. So it really didn't, 
it really didn't work. But we were trying to teach her to just come as you are. Throw this wig on, come as you are. But that concept is hard sometimes to even leave the house as we are. We can't really do that, right? We have to put on like an acceptable appearance. God, we don't have to. We come as we are because if you put on an acceptable appearance for God, he still knows what's in the heart. And so this song is about coming as you are. If you're sad today, bring it to him. If you're weak today, bring it to him. If you're burdened today, bring it to him. If you are lonely today, bring it to him. If you are carrying baggage, bring it to him and drop it and fall in his arms. You can trust him to catch you and to accept you as you are and to forgive you and to offer you grace that we can't understand. And so I just want us, as we sing this song, I want you to leave whatever you have with him. I want you to fall in his arms and I want you to come the way you are. Quit trying to hide from God or be something that you're not. Let him forgive you and pour grace on you and bring your sin and your ugliness and your dirtiness and your filth and leave it with him and and you can trust him to catch you. You can fall back and he will catch you and he will take that burden for you and he will carry it. So worship with us as we sing, come as you are.
Thank you, Jesus. Say hi to someone and you may be seated. Tyler, nice to see you. Amen. Nice to see all of you, including Tyler. God bless all of you today. Nice to see you. I don't know what that was. I don't think I'll use this. I think I'll just use paper. Nice to see you. Quick announcement. I need all of you men to stay right after church. Well, let me rephrase that. Jackie needs all of you men to stay right after church. <laughs> Jackie's going to do a little bit of rearranging, set up a couple of tables in here. So if any of you men can hang on for a few minutes and grab Jackie, uh, we'll just drag a few chairs where we have to and set up a couple of tables like she wants to for the 2 o'clock meeting today with uh, Samaritan's Purse and Operation Christmas Child. And every year y'all do that and she does a great job and we stack up shoe boxes like crazy. And so thank you, we're gonna do it again this Christmas. And, and the speaker today at two will give a great story about her own experience with that. So thank you. So remember, don't leave now. Also, if you'll hang on right after the cameras go off, I'll give you a couple of updates that just don't need to be on live streaming. One in particular. So if you have to go, you have to go. If you got a couple of minutes, as soon as the uh, cameras are off and we're ready to move on, I'll share a couple of things with you that uh, pertain to the church. God bless all of you. You look really good. I mean, for the most part, one or two exceptions, the rest of you really look good. <laughs> Today, thank you very much for being here. Larry baptized Larry yesterday, and uh, thank God for that. That's a great example, great faith. And then this morning, the baptistry was leaking. I don't know what the connection was. <laughs> Baptizing Larry and the leaking baptistry today, but so be it. It'll leak anytime. Anytime you want to be baptized, let me know. We'll baptize you, and we don't mind if it leaks thereafter. Y'all did notice last week, Allison's always fond of pointing out other people's birthdays or grandparents' day that she overlooked and forgot or anything else like that. But did you notice a week or so ago when it was her birthday, she went silent and didn't bring up <laughs> that she had had a birthday because she was close to 50? I said close. Relatively speaking, you're close. You're closer to 50 than you are to 25. So, in fact, in fact, you're closer to 50 than you are to 40. So we'll just leave that hanging right there for later. I want to uh, depress you again today. It seems to be my task anymore. I just want to depress you. And so today, as optimistic as this sounds, the common link to the heroes of faith, it's not optimistic, it's pessimistic, get ready. Just go ahead and get in your gloomy mood, get ready to be let down and depressed like you pretty much are every Sunday. <laughs> I, uh, I want to uh, I wanna ask four uh, questions and they really don't have uh, much to do with a, a scriptural basis other than where we're going after a while. Uh, they will probably have more roots in uh, some old military evasion strategy than anything else. When I was in the uh, Army, I, I got to participate in at least three bivouacs. I'm trying to think if there were more. I did one out in West Texas somewhere near Camp Bullis, or it might have been on Camp Bullis. I don't know. That might be a huge base hidden over there in the hill country. Uh, but I think it was just out in some government-owned land somewhere. That was a three-day bivouac. It included one course in evasion. You know, everything about military is not fight and kill. Sometimes just hide and know when to hide. And so you, you had to know when to evade and, and when to hide. In that particular one, that three-day bivouac, yeah, th bivouac means you go out in the wild and live out there on sea rations and or in that particular one, every, every soldier had to kill an animal and you had to dress it and eat a portion of it. And yes, animals were harmed in that uh, process. And we didn't have to catch them. They actually had them in boxes for us. 
living creatures. That's as far as I guess I would need to go. And that was one of the exercises. We were actually attacked by helicopters in that one once. We were gas attacked once. We were ground attacked once over three days. Exciting three days. Did another one in Fort Polk, Louisiana. That one was primarily to learn how to set up a secure base and how to organize your command units within yourself as if your team had been destroyed and your officers had been killed. And uh, there was a small applause went up when we heard that. Sorry for you officers, Larry and others who were officers in the Army. And then we had to set our own command base up on a, on a hill and uh, our own perimeter. And we had to uh, arrive at our own people in charge and who could manage it. it. Just proving teamwork and you can do what you have to. And then we were attacked at night by the, the pajama wearing cadre, black pajamas, I guess. I don't know. They were just wearing black clothing so that we couldn't see them at night. And then I did another one uh, in, uh, in Kansas, and that was uh, primarily for uh, finding booby traps in a village and how to sweep a village and how to, uh, you know, route out an enemy and how to capture and identify and all those kind of things. But in the middle of all of those, in the Camp Bullis in particular, you, 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 you go through a simple process of identifying what you can about the enemy, looking for a place to hide, to evade, and, uh, and in the strategy if you can or you cannot. It's uh, just a great part of military training. Some of you men went through similar things. I was attached to 25th uh, Infantry, and 25th Infantry in particular was set up for tropic uh, warfare. In fact, uh, <clears throat> I, I challenged a young man at the Army Surplus over here in the spring because I went in one day and asked for the little decal that's on the back of my car, a little uh, decal that's back there that says 25th Infantry, and I just keep it on there for other veterans of Vietnam who would identify with it. And he said, I pointed to the little decal, and I said, I want one of those. And he said, oh, you want the electric strawberry? And I said, excuse me? He said, we call that the electric strawberry. It's a strawberry with a jagged uh, yellow line through it. And I said, well, let me correct you. That is called tropic lightning. No, he said, we call it the electric strawberry. And I said, well, let me just tell you from now on, you better call it the tropic lightning. And he turned around and looked at me, and I just gave him this look. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, is that what it's called? And I said, that is what it's called. And it would be anything other than respect to call it something silly. It's a tropic lightning. Call it tropic lightning. Yes, sir, he said. I'm sure when I left, he called some friends and said, <laughs> some old dude came in and jumped on me for calling it the electric strawberry. Hey, it's tropic lightning. We were designed to fight in the tropics, and we were designed to bring lightning to the tropic areas. That's the reason it's got the electric strawberry, which is tropic lightning. And uh, amazingly, all of that uh, training that seemed so unnecessary and foolish at the time actually has its relevance and has its place. Only one time in my 13 months in Vietnam did I actually have to fall back on this and wish that I had paid better attention. And that was a, a little side story where I was AWOL one time and stranded a few miles from my base camp and literally had to walk on foot on a little narrow uh, bulldozer graded road uh, a few miles to my camp. And I heard the motorcycles coming behind me long before they got to me. I heard them getting louder. I knew they were coming up this lonely, untraveled road. The grass on the side of the road was literally head high. It would have been so easy for me to practice what I'd been taught and realize this is a good time to step into the grass and hide and wait and see who's passing by. But it never occurred to me that there might be a problem. I just assumed it was travelers passing by. Instead, it was uh, uh, at least three, uh, three had double riders on it. One had one by himself. I think he was a leader. And so seven guys, uh, I think, uh, 
uh, saw Walker in uniform with no weapon, and they just, one whipped over in front, one behind, a couple of them beside, and I was pinned against the high grasses and those guys. And I, I stood there thinking, oh my goodness, I had minutes. I could have just stepped into the grasses. No one would have seen me, and they were gone. I could have evaded the enemy, and I didn't. And now it's too late to go hiding anywhere. And so now we had to step into other strategies and try to figure out what to do. I want to share a couple of points from that for you because they're going to lead us to a scripture in a moment, maybe. But the first question that you ought to ask yourself is, well, what are you afraid of? What is your enemy? Who, who do you fear? <clears throat> and, uh, and I'm not talking about politics and or pandemic unless those are the things you fear. If those are the things that weigh on you, if you're afraid of uh, sickness, if you're afraid of cancer, if you're afraid of divorce, if you're afraid of losing your money, uh, whatever you fear, you, you have an enemy. You need to identify what that enemy is. Now, the scripture will tell us you have an enemy. The scripture identifies a spiritual enemy very clearly. Uh, the Bible tells us that the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy. And that would tell you and me, it should tell us, literally, that we have a spiritual enemy. There is someone spiritual who wants to destroy you. But you may not see him as your enemy. You, you may not even recognize him when he comes around. You may just think everything is health or money or politics or government or church or parents or leader or spouse. Everything's an employer. Everything's just somebody against you. But and it might be, but the scripture tells us we have, we really do have enemies. It, it also, New Testament cautions not to wrestle against flesh and blood. That's not where our great battles are. But our battles are against powers and principalities and rulers of wickedness and high places. And so there is an enemy and it's imperative at some point that you and I identify whether we have one at all and what that enemy might be. Because if you don't know what the enemy is, you can't very well prepare to do anything about an enemy. It's one of the great failures that anyone in military would tell you is the training. If in evasion training, it was always what's coming at you? What's, what's your opponent? Do you have time to evade? If you're outnumbered, you really, you know, TV, one person can whip 17 martial arts trained people and minimum blood and almost no broken bones except for the one inflicting damage on 17. Now that's great for TV. Realistically, the one is dead. If it's one against 17, he's dead. I, I don't care. I don't care how cool he is. I don't care how handsome he looks. I don't care how fast he can do something, he's dead. If he's got 17 armed and trained assassins coming at him. It's one reason TV is so fun. It's such a science fiction diversion to watch one man. I'll tell you something even more sexist so you can all leave saying, well, I guess he thinks that women are not as strong as men. I saw one recently, a woman one woman trained in the Army Rangers just beat the dickens out of, I don't know, like seven men in one fight. It was so cool. And they were all trained as well, just not clearly as trained as her in hand-to-hand -hand killing, apparently. She's awesome. And I, I don't mind telling you, I watched it with a smile. It wasn't supposed to be a comedy. It's supposed to be revenge and all that, and I just watched it. That's funny. Oh, look Oh, look at that. How did she duck that fast when he was coming up behind her? Wow, she just sensed that the sword was coming, and she whoop, whoop, and it went over her head. And she, oh, my word, y'all don't believe any of that. That's kind of like believing in wrestling. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> any, any WW, is that what it's called, WW, any WW, WWE? WWW, I don't know what it is. I don't mean to mess anybody's fantasy world up, but 
But you know, I, I don't mind telling you, in the military, if you're one and there's five coming at you, but you have a chance to evade before they detect you, you evade. You, you hide. So if you can identify your enemy or you, what you're afraid of, and then there's a place to hide, well, hide. If you're afraid of, of a virus, can you hide? Is there a good place to hide from it? Don't go to work. Don't go to church. Don't go to the stores. Don't allow anyone to come to your house from a store. Don't breathe. Don't breathe the air. If you're afraid of, uh, if you're afraid of uh, losing your money, Jesus told a good story about three men, a servant. Some will give one, five, one, two, one, one. And, and, and this one guy was afraid he would lose if he invested. So he, he just hid what he had so he could just give to the master. Look, I knew you were a hard man. And when you came, you sometimes reap where you don't sow. Here's why you was given by you. I hid it so I can give it back to you. And the master cursed him. No, nope, you should have invested what I gave you. Because you didn't, get out of here. You're done. He was just trying to hide what he had. He was just trying not to lose. Sometimes, you know, I mean, I don't know. Whatever your great fear is, can you, can you hide from the devil? Can you hide from your lust? Can you hide from temptation? Can, can you hide? If you can, then hide. That's the whole point of evasion technique. Hide if you can. If you're outnumbered, if you're outgunned, if you can't beat the devil, hide from him. So you got it? I, I, I know this doesn't have much to do. And then you, you, before you do too much hiding, you kind of have to think, what would the outcome be if I hide? If I hide, do I destroy the enemy? Does he just camp here and wait till I crawl out? Uh, what if I don't hide? What if I decide to resist? What can I do? I had to make that decision on the side of a road one time. What, what do, what's... What's the outcome going to be if I do this, if I do that? What, what should I do first? What, what, where should I be? What position? What, all these, those things. But, you know, you, you, you don't have hours to go jump online and Google a response. You, you have to reflex. It's just a response. I don't, I don't know what to do. You, you have to know. You have to think, what will be the result? How long can I hide? Proverbs comes to mind, uh, a, a slothful, careless man hides in the house and says, I can't go out, there's a lion in the street. Well, how long will the lion be there if the lion is only in your imagination? How long will he last? Will he be there tomorrow? Will he be there next month? Will he be there next year? Can, he, can, the, can the imaginary lion last for five years? And can you stay hidden that long? Uh, what do you do? All of us have to answer these questions with our own spiritual connection with God. If you confront the enemy, what happens next? What if it kills you? What if the enemy wins and, and you die? Okay, that's a real possibility. Happens a lot, I think. Well, what if you win? Well, then what's next? And these are just, it's, it's just, it's silly. It's not even really worth pointing out too much today for a preliminary statement to this brief message I really want to bring to you. But it, it is just one of those things, part of my uh, past and part of my mental development, I suppose, and spiritual development. Always identify an enemy. Always try to avoid a fight if you think you're outnumbered and outgunned. If you're not, and you have no choice but confrontation, well, how do you confront? If you can hide, how long do you have to hide? If you confront and lose, what's going to happen to you? Are you POW or are you MIA? And uh, you have to think about it. And you do when you've been in that position and you've been in that training. I literally stood on the side of the road in that scenario, and, and I realized... If they kill me, the grass is this high, they'll drag, they can drag me 10 feet, I'll never be seen by this road. Nobody passing by will ever see. My parents will never know where my body was put. I will be MIA. And, and, and so just total assessment, where, what, 
what will happen? What's the worst thing that could happen? What's the best thing that could happen? And no matter what happens, if you're still alive and standing, then what? Because you're not through just when you fight a battle. There's always a next one. There's always another goal. You're never finished. You never come to an end. You never have a victory. You never celebrate a victory because there's always another step. There's always a brother to the brother. There's always a cousin to the cousin. There's always something next. And that's just part of that world and, and that training. I tell you all that just so I can jump to a familiar passage of Scripture. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, is nicknamed the roll call of the heroes of faith. When you read the 11th chapter of Hebrews, you read these names, and each one of them starts with, by faith. By faith, Enoch, he did not taste death. God took him. That's cool. Something about that connection, that's a great connection there. I, just by faith. We don't know a lot about the life of Enoch. We just know... For whatever reason, God said, I'm just going to take this man to me. By faith, Noah. Oh, there's a story we know. We, we, we got to hear that one in Sunday school. Noah, 120 years maybe he spent building that ark. 120 years preaching a message of righteousness to a world that didn't want to listen. 120 years. He must have been mocked and made fun of a lot of time building a what? What is this thing you're doing? You and your boys are, boy, you, what kind of house is this? It's a floating house. Why? There's no lake anywhere nearby. You don't have a trailer to hit, hitch to your oxen and haul it somewhere. What are you doing? And, you know, his only answer could be, I'm just doing what God told me to do. Man, I'm, I guess I'm marking time, but God said do this. I'm doing it. What a great story, except that nobody believed him. Nobody listened to his sermons. Nobody listened to his explaining why I'm doing this. Nobody believed him when he said, now the animals are going to come and we're going to put animals in here. And then anybody wants to get on board, we're going to rise above water. When the water comes, nah, nah, you're an idiot. You're dumb. It's a great story unless you're Noah and then you realize you spent 120 years without a friend. You spent 120 years as the fool in the village, the idiot kind of the way I feel sometimes trying to talk to a handful of people these days. Yeah, okay, preacher, yeah, we know you're a preacher, yeah, whatever. Okay, doctor, you got the answers? You and your friends? No. Okay, reverend, how about you? Well, you know, my church is trying to, whatever, and ain't nobody knows what they're doing these days unless they're just trusting God. Idiots, dummies, why would you do that? Well, same reason Noah did. We believe we've heard from God. We believe we've got the written promise of God. It's pretty tough. And now remember when you read the 11th chapter, go back and read it sometime today. I don't want to take time to read the whole chapter. You go read it sometime today. When you're reading this, just remember, none of these people right here who are tagged with that preface, by faith, none of these people had easy lives. None of these people owned the high-rise buildings, none of them had luxury. All of these people struggled. Every one of these people had an enemy, somebody opposing them. Abraham, look how many battles Abraham went into. Battles, real battles. He wasn't a warrior king with an army. He just had a handful of servants, a big handful of servants, and he just called them his, uh, guys, we got to go against these kings. Hey, I'm going to give everybody a, um, I don't know, just grab something out of the barns and sharpen it. We're going to be an army. Hey, that's not fun. Why are we going to do this? I, God told me to go take it. it. Wasn't pleasant. Lost people along the way. Isaac, Jacob, man. Jacob, you know, name changed. Israel, great. But read his biography. Read his story. By faith, Jacob. And then you just think, man, what a struggle his life was. How intriguing some of these lives were. Moses, same thing. By faith, Moses, 80 years old. And then it was time for him to do something for God. 
And boy, what did he do except get chewed out by the Egyptians, chased by them, and then chewed out by the people he rescued constantly, always bickering, always telling him how evil he was. You, you made us leave. In Egypt, we had, I, I'm kind of with him on this. I don't mind telling you, I do like onions. I have onions every time I can risk having onions. My wife will tell you I get an onion all the time. There's always an onion on my counter. Whatever I eat, unless it's fish, that's about the only thing I don't eat onions with. Everything else is onion compatible. I would have been like the Egypt, I would have been like the Israelites. Moses, at least in Egypt we had onions and leeks. I don't know what a leek is, but we had them in Egypt and we got nothing out here. That was what they did. That was Moses' life as a great leader. You know, a lot of people saying, oh, thank you, adorable leader, you let us out. No, no, no. He was just constantly bombarded and attacked by them. But by faith, but by faith, he did it. And so you just keep going down them. Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Gideon reduced an army to a time. Let's go to battle. And then God said, okay, now you do this and reduce your army by this many and reduce it by this many. And finally, he just got a handful of people to go to battle with. Why? Jephthah, Samson, David, Samuel, all these people are mentioned in the scripture. Now, here's the point. You're not going to like his point. It's going to be depressing. You know what they all had in common? All these people had one thing in common. You know what they had in common? It's in verse 11. They all died. Great people of faith. Great people of faith. So great that they were all lumped together in one, in one place in Hebrews. I'm going to tell you about some great people, the writer of Hebrews said. And I just started listing them. Enoch, Noah, Abraham. Best company of faith bearers you can put together in one paragraph. Here they all are. And when you get reading that story, then you read, now these all died. Oh, I know, in faith. These all died. I hate to be so depressing sometimes on Sunday, but you know, th this is part of my life, my business. I, I walk people through death far more times than I like. It never gets easier. I look from this side to this side, and I can just walk around the room and see people who have lost their spouse, their spouse, their spouse, their spouse, their spouse, their child, their mother, their father, their daughter, their son, unexpectedly, untimely, didn't want it to happen, begged God not to let it happen, but these all died in faith. Last year during pandemic, we didn't lose anybody to the virus, but we did have about 10 deaths last year. And, uh, and every year it will be the same, you know, I mean, it's always been that way, but nonetheless, uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, you know, I've, I've, reached that place in age where almost everyone who passes away is younger than me, which means I'm next. I know. I'm, I'm on the list now. I'm on the short list. I, I kept calling myself middle-aged up until I was about uh, 68. And then I said one time to a man I was playing golf with a few years ago, I said, well, you know, when you're middle-aged like we are, and he just stopped and turned around. Did you say middle age? And I said, yes. He said, let me think, how old are you? And then he started adding them up. He said, so you plan to live to be 160, no, 130, no. How long do you think you'll live? I don't know, 80. Then 40 would be middle age, not nearly 70. Okay, smarty, why don't you just put a calculator to it? I just meant a generic term Middle age. I'm not fooling myself. I know I'm well past middle years. I wake up every morning, and one of the first things I privately do, well, 
I was going to say one of the first things I probably do is I just thank God that I woke up on the right side, you know. But sometimes the first thing I probably do is shake her to make sure she's still alive. <laughs> and then, and I know the minute she grunts, what are you doing? Uh, she, she's still alive. And, uh, and then I thank God that we're both on the right side of, uh, of the grass. And I also know it won't last forever. I live knowing that I live knowing that I'm going to die. Don't you? Really? Now, I don't know what I'm going to die from. I may die from this virus that's got everybody terrified. I might die from the flu. I was just watching a commercial the other night. I think my wife was gone to the ladies thing, and I just sat there in the chair with full control of the remote for a while. And... Uh, <laughs> And there was a commercial about the flu vaccine. And, and, and I thought, well, I hadn't gotten it in the last few years. A few times I got it, I got the flu. In the last few years, I've been flu free because I didn't get the vaccine. And then I'm watching this commercial and the commercial was a warning. If you're over 65, don't you just get any flu vaccine. You better talk to your doctor. I can't remember the brand on it. I should have written it down. Good Lord, I don't know what I was thinking. I did not write down the brand because that commercial said, ask your doctor about this specific brand because it's the only one that's rated for people over 65. That's the one you need to take. And I'm sitting there at 70, how old am I? Two? 72. I said 71 for a whole year. It's hard for me to remember now. And I'm sitting there at 72 thinking, oh my God, if I get the wrong flu vaccine, I'm going to die this year. I got to get the right one. I'll have to go back and try to find that commercial and see if I can find the right flu vaccine because that could be the thing that happens this year. I know this is depressing. I don't mean for it to be. I'm not depressed. I don't fear death any more today at 72 than I did at 50 years old. I probably feared death more at 20 years old when I was surrounded by seven guys on the side of a road four miles from my camp in the middle of absolute God-forsaken Vietnam nowhere. And I pretty much knew in that moment I'm going to die on the side of this road. I probably feared death more right then in that moment than I fear standing here today. I see death simply as <laughs> the absolute target of everybody's life. Great men of faith, these all died in faith. Wait a minute, Enoch? Yeah, I know, I know the Lord took him, but I also know that he's in this same list of people right here. And verse 13 says, these all died. And so we continue to die because that is what we do. And you're going to die. And I'm not trying to depress you today. I want to stress to you the uniqueness of this phrase, Hebrews 11, 13. These all died, but they died in faith. You see that bottom line right there? You're going to die. Everybody here is going to. Now, I hope for most of y'all it's a long way off. But I know it's coming somewhere out there. The only thing that gives me joy as a pastor attending funerals and praying for the sick and praying for the terminal, the only thing that gives me joy is knowing that they have faith. And I don't get depressed thinking, well, if they had faith, they wouldn't be sick. That's silly. If they had faith, they wouldn't be in the hospital. That's, that's just absolutely embarrassing. If they had faith, they wouldn't die. How foolish can we be? Dying has nothing to do with whether you believe in God or have faith. To, dying is a, what you started the day you were born. The only glory we get in death is knowing that we died in faith, not in fear. I, I don't want to die in fear. I want to die in faith. I want you to die believing God. But you don't understand, Pastor. I've got friends. I know. I know. 
I know. Did you know there are people trying to muzzle the mouth of preachers today talking about trusting God and healing and believing God's a healer because, well, what do you do about brother so-and-so? He died from COVID. I know. I know, Sandy and I have many friends our age. <clears throat> we have watched uh, over the, just the last few weeks, we have watched pastors' wives uh, pass away, uh, a couple of them from uh, COVID. We have watched uh, a couple of pastors, uh, much younger than us, pass away from COVID. We know that. Did they not have faith in God? That's foolish. Of course they had faith in God. They died in faith. They didn't die because they lost faith. They didn't die because God forsook them. They died because it was their time. It's appointed unto man wants to die. But you only believe that if you believe in God and trust him. If you don't trust him, then you think that maybe hiding will help. Maybe fighting, I, I got to find the right way to fight. See, while I know friends who have passed away from this particular virus, I also have buried 15 or 20 in the last couple of years who died from totally unrelated causes. What shall we say about that? Do we question God over that or do we just understand God's in charge of life and death? All I'm in charge of is my faith or my fear. I get to choose whether I go to my grave in faith whether I go through my sickness still believing God, whether I go through my fears, giving them to God and translating them into faith, or whether I go to my grave hunkered down in fear that God's not in control of my life like he promised me he would be. God's not really listening. God's not really capable. I got a friend who passed away, close to, right at my age, close to my age, uh, passed away. And uh, one of my Vietnam uh, buddies, one of the men that I uh, met in Vietnam, and uh, he was a medic in Vietnam. He passed away last uh, August. A after spending a whole month invited to preach at camp meetings and youth camps over in Alabama, and my good friend Ron, a uh, Vietnam buddy, in fact, he and I uh, took a, 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 an R&R &R to Sydney, Australia, a wonderful uh, seven, eight days uh, in Sydney and uh, a great companion, a wonderful man of God. And uh, he came to my Thursday night uh, uh, prayer session in Vietnam every Thursday night. Just a great, unless there were crises, just a great, great man. I would say that if you put me and him on a spiritual scale side by side to see which one of us has the greater spirituality, it'd be somewhere about like here, me down here and him up here. Ron was just absolutely a superb man. Looked a lot like Roy Clark. Some of you will remember that name. If you're under 20, you don't. But uh, he looked a lot like Roy Clark. He also played the guitar and sang wonderfully as a country singer. And he played the guitar and sounded like Roy Clark when he played and sang. Had a lot of resemblance to him. Last year, Ron got the privilege of being the designated speaker at a couple of camp meetings and two youth camps. He spent the entire month of July speaking at youth camps in Alabama, North Mississippi, and camp meetings. And then he got COVID after the last one, went home and died two weeks later. Because he lost faith? <laughs> no, he died in faith. Silly. Don't miss this point. Time for him to go, he died in faith. One of our other buddies, one of his and my other good friend got the same disease in November last year. And I said, what did you do? What did you take? He said, I did nothing. He said, my attitude was, if God wants me to live, I'll live. If God doesn't, I'm done anyway. So I'm just going to tell my wife to move out of the house. She went down the street and lived with my daughter. I hunkered down in the house by myself. There were three or four days I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't even go hardly get anything. I'd loaded a tray up with drinks and put in there so I didn't have to go to the kitchen. I just turned around and drank more Gatorade, sick as I've ever been. So after about three or four days of not being able to get out of the bed, I just said my goodbyes to the world and said my goodbye to my wife on the phone. She's crying. She's going to come to the house. I said, do not come to the house. If I don't call you tomorrow afternoon, I didn't make it. I don't call you in the next couple of days. 
You can come fumigate this place and take care of it. He said, I spent two day, two weeks in my house alone. I was able to call her the day after I thought I was going to die that night. And I said, well, what'd you take? He said, I took nothing. I just drank juices and kept fluids going, and I just said, if I never die, I'm in God's hands. I was, he didn't recommend that to me. He didn't recommend that to anybody. And I just said, you know, I have discovered, my friend, that I have a different kind of faith than a handful of people that I've pastored, people I've tried to help over the years, and I wish that I could give my faith to some other folks. I wish I could make them see the contrast between living in fear and living in faith. Living in faith doesn't mean being foolish and stupid and just going out there and doing whatever. Living in faith means just I'll be careful, I'll be precautious, I'll do what I can, but I cannot hide. I cannot stop living because then I'm dead already. I cannot stop believing and helping others because then I'm scared to even lay hands on the sick or pray for the leper or whatever else Christ might have wanted us to do. And I can't give it to folks. And I said to him, so where did you get this faith that you had to just say, I live or die. I'm not, I'm not going to do anything about it. It's in God's hand. I'm just going to try to munch on soup if I can. I feel like it, whatever. And he just laughed and he said, I've been to Vietnam. And I knew he was joking, but I got it. That was our phrase for a long, long time. When we did anything crazy and risky, we would say, what are you going to do? Send me to Nam? I've been there already. What are you going to do? Now, those of you that don't know, Nam was not a great place to be. We didn't have air-conditioned tents to live in. We had no hot water. I never had a hot shower in Vietnam because we had cold water out of a little barrel on top of two-by-fours. And, uh, and we had mold and mildew, and we had rats, and we had roaches, and we had fever and sicknesses and snakes, and that's what we lived in. The Army Corps of Engineers had dug little uh, bunkers beside our hooches and covered them with uh, sandbags to run into when we got hit with mortar, only they forgot to put a drain in there. So when the monsoon, first monsoon, came and filled up all the bunkers, there was no place for the water to go. And the sun couldn't even evaporate it because it's covered with sandbags. So now we just had mud slime pits in which rats, roaches, and snakes festered and grew. And we had to nail up plywood to keep things from crawling out of there into the little shacks that we lived in called hooches. And that's the way. By the time I got there, they were mold and mildew infested. And everybody, I got, I got scars on my hip from things that grew on my body. Don't know what they were. Got ringworm on my leg. It was filthy. It was slimy. It was nasty. I have a jacket that says, when I die, I'm going to heaven because I spent my time in hell. And it's got a map of Vietnam on it. And that was the attitude of soldiers. What are you going to do worse to me than it has already been done? What are you going to do to me? Send me to Nam? I've been there, bud. Ain't nothing you can do any worse. So I knew when he said, <laughs> I've been to Nam. He didn't mean I've been to the worst place I could be. He meant that in that worst place, you know what all of us boys learned over there? You either trust God or you die. You might die anyway. But it's completely in God's hand. Had no choir on Sunday because we had no church, had no pastor, had no telephone communication back home with moms, dads, or anybody else, no Sunday school teachers. It was just us and God. And if you can't find God, then you're going to be alone. And if you find God, you're going to find out whether or not God will really do anything for you. And those of us like him, we discovered God will do it. There's so many silly things we did in faith, but it's all right. We're still standing today. Malaria. I didn't take the malaria pill. I was supposed to every Monday. I didn't take it. I had friends take it, and I had friends who took it and got malaria. Not because they didn't trust God. It just That's what happens. Life. I could have gotten it. I could have died from it. And had it been my time, I would have. Because I have lived for a long time knowing that life is uncertain. I have pastored so long now that I have almost seen any and every kind of death that you can imagine. And the timing is never right. And the circumstances are always bad. But I can tell you, I also know the difference in dying in faith and dying in fear. And that's the only thing you have control of today. 
You do not have control over your dying. The only thing you control is are you going to die in faith or are you going to die in fear? Because your day will come. And when it comes, you'll lay down in faith or you'll lay down in fear. You'll lay down worried more about an enemy than you will rejoicing about a Savior. And my prayer for you is that you will understand the simplicity of this message today and grab a hold of it. Let me close with this. Let's jump all the way back to Isaiah writing to an idolatrous nation. Israel had sunk into the worst idolatry, even sacrificing kids to one of their false gods, Molech, I believe. And Isaiah writes to them from the hand of God, God God's pen writing through Isaiah and Isaiah in first person begins to attack them from God. The righteous man dies, he says. Good people die. No one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away. No one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. All of you who have lost spouses, Family members, kids, parents, uh, get this verse. Your righteous friends and family that died, you know what happened when they died? They, they were taken away from more calamity. They'll never know any more sickness. They'll never know any more disease. They'll never know any more chaos and confusion. They won't see any more political stupidity. They'll have no more arguments and complaints about how dumb and crazy the world is getting, they're taken away from all of that. And they enter into peace. But you, the rest of you, you sons of sorceress, offspring of the adulterer and the loose woman, he's talking about idolaters now, who are you mocking? Behind the door and the doorpost, you've set up your memorials to your false gods and deserted me, the God that should have been in your homes. And then look at verse 11. Who did you dread and fear so that you lied and did not remember me and did not lay it to heart? Remember I started this by asking, who do you fear? What are you afraid of? Did you know that sometimes if you're not careful, you get so afraid of somebody or something that it will actually make you deny the words of God and forget the promises of God? You'll believe more what you read on Facebook of all places than what you can read in the scripture about the almighty God. And that's where our nation has, we are now a nation of Facebook followers, not word followers. And here's what God said to them. Who did you dread and fear so that you lied and didn't remember me and didn't lay my words to heart? I've held my peace for a long time and still you don't fear me. And there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So we could quit right here and say we got a good lesson from God, but we don't have the whole story. In Isaiah 57 and 18, in the middle of his disappointment while rebuking the fearful mockers that Israel had become, God, still riding on that careful and shaking hand of Isaiah, God says of that fallen people, I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. See that? See the word but? He, he, he says, I've seen him. I know he's a mocker. I know he's forgotten my promises and he's following false gods. I know that. But, the word but means in spite of. In spite of what I know he's done, I'm still going to heal him. I'm going to bring him up. I'm going to restore him. I'm going to bring him back into my fellowship. I've seen his ways. I will heal him. I have seen his ways. I will heal him. I have seen his ways. I read this verse this week, and when I read it, I stopped like I'm stopping with you right now. 
And I just closed my eyes, sitting in my chair at home, at my desk, and I just said, God, you have seen my ways. And in spite of what you've seen in me, you're going to heal me. You're going to restore me. Stand, please. I wish you'd personalize that last verse. He has seen your ways. God, you have seen my ways. You've seen my fears. You've seen my anger. You've seen my retaliation. You've seen my doubts. You've seen my grudges. You've seen everything I've done that's contrary to you and to your word. And yet, in spite of me and my weaknesses, you will still heal me. And that is a promise that I want to cling to today. In spite of us, God knows we're human. God knows we fail. But he also knows we're his. And he's still going to keep knocking on your door and trying to get you to turn his direction and heal you. Father, I pray for us today in Jesus' name. Bless all of us. Bless us in your word. As depressing as it seems to just talk about the fact we're going to die, I mean for it to inspire us that we can choose the way we die. We can die in faith or we can die in fear. And for me and my house, we have chosen. I will choose it today. We will die believing in you. It will not be because our faith failed that we died. It will be because it was time for us to go. And when we die, we will escape all future calamities in this world. And we will enter into peace because we will die in believing in faith, all those men did awesome things. Those men and women of Hebrews 11 did some awesome things in faith, and yet they all died. They just died in faith. And so us, Lord, I pray for us today in Christ's wonderful name that you give us that kind of faith and courage to choose our destiny in Jesus' name. And somebody say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Will you give the Lord a hand of praise today? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.